Let us 
even though he was a pastor at that time. But in any event, he changed course fully. And when we were stuck in Tel Aviv Airport under military arrest in 1986, she was one of the ones that commanded the mayor of the city to come down to our school, Barashim, Cultural Institute, and to sit there and call the governor of the state and call this one and call that one. They got our people trapped over in Israel, and we want these Israelis to let them go. So she was a strong force and, uh, because she was also a political activist behind the scenes. She never wanted the title. She never wanted the position. She was one of those strong black women to make up most black communities. And all the black communities all across America and across Africa, we got women that you don't play with and don't mess with. And she was one of them. And she was a very friend and a strong ally to our community. So she was very much worthy of having some words spoken uh, in her behalf. Fortunately, fortunately, by instinct, I happened to call the husband two weeks ago. And she happened to be home too. And spoke with uh, them. And she asked about everyone, asked about who I asked about how everybody's doing. Total clarity of mind. I don't know what happens on a normal basis, but she was very clear and very strong. And um, I spoke to the <laughs> I spoke to the husband at the house, um, Mother Joan doing. He said she's fine, she's just hard at it to still make it <laughs> So I had to bust out laughing because that's where they are always talking to each other. I said the problem is not that both retired in the house. With the biggest war fight they got going on who controls the remote control. <laughs> the program is on the TV. But anyway, uh, I was happy that she laughed and happy that I haven't spoke to her in a while. I haven't spoke to her since the pandemic. When I was there the last time, I did go to the house and see her, but that was two years ago. And so I'm just happy in my soul that I had a chance to speak to her about two weeks ago. And um, I hear her voice strong, Papa said. Said to me, well, you know, I'm no longer at the health center. I said, yeah, I thought about that. I know that. I think she forgot that. I know she retired almost about five years. But anyway, she would always make sure if I walk through those doors, I wait on no line, no queue, and I didn't pay no bills. She was always like, Ralph Cohen is here, check him up, give him a full checkup, and send his bill upstairs to the director so that he don't have to pay. So, Mama Joan, we love you. We miss your spirit. Yes, sir. Mama yes, Lord. Yes. May you rest in peace. Hallelujah. Yes, hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. And may Elder Beat Dow and family be strong. Yes. They were so close. They were together since teenagers. They both approaching 90. Yes. So they must have been together, married over 70 years. So the, the two souls go together. So we have to pray for his strength. And in the dirt. I believe we went through Lech Lecha. Am I correct? So this week we are in Guayikara, the lesson in chapter 18, verse 1. Chapter 18, verse 1. I mean, last week you went over the 400 year prophecy to it. Yes. Chapter 15. Mm -hmm. And you went through Melchizedek. Yes. That's a whole lot of the lesson. Thank you. 
a neighboring camp or a temple or a Knesset or a Mikdash, you know, you look for how the people treat you, how they receive you. And they receive you well and offer you something to eat or drink, treat you with all the cordialities. We say, truly, I have come and received the hospitality of Abraham. The famous statement that we have as Hebrews is that the hospitality of Abraham, that's our character trademark of treating even strangers well, even if you don't know them. And it comes from this statement here. It comes from this act here of how Abraham treated three strangers. And not knowing that the opening of his actions were before his revelation that they were angels. And this is where they have it also uh, and what is mentioned in some of the, one of the passages in the, in the call book of the New Covenant, that beware of strangers who you entertain, because you may entertain angels unaware. And then they refer you back to this scripture, as with Abraham. And so you see Abraham was in the tent of his day, and you know, in the heat of the day, he must have just actually been nodding. You know, if you say in the hot afternoon, He's in the door of his tent, and all of a sudden he looks up like a mirage almost and sees three men coming his way. And they used to say the way Abraham would set up camp, it wasn't like Abraham had a tent. And he was just moseying along, him and Sarah, with a bunch of sheep and um, cattle. I mean, Abraham had a whole crew with him. When he moved, he moved like with a city and with a company. So when they set up camp, it was like a city or company. And he said, Abraham set up his camp every time they had an encampment with uh, watches on all four cardinal points. Watches on the east, watches on the west, watches on the north, and watches on the south. What do I mean by watches? We designated that from whatever point you've seen a stranger or a traveler coming, he has somebody that can notice you and welcome you into his camp. So these three appeared before him sitting in the door of his tent. And he ran out to meet them. And when you show serious respect for a stranger, the serious respect that you show for a stranger, they did the honorary uh, protocol of the day. Now what do I call the honorary protocol of the day? In the West, we've all been taught to shake hands. I say that in the West. You know, when you see brothers and sisters today, even though now the COVID period has brought us back around, don't shake hands. But customarily, we've all taken up the Western culture of shaking hands. You know, and I say West meaning because when they shake hands, there's a distance between you. Usually because they don't trust each other. And so they want you to put forward your sword hand to make sure you ain't gonna cut them or stab them or nothing. So it's like, on oh God, I shake your hand. But in the East, you know, we, even if we shake hands, we bring about the embrace and that we touch each other, you know, chest to chest, breast to breast, and even on the side of each other's ears. So it brings a little more comfort to it. You know, for those who have ever taken martial arts or even observed on TV, when you get on the map of martial arts, before you even face an opponent, you always go, you know, but you don't take your eye off the opponent. You usually go like that. It means it's to bow down. You know, in martial arts, you don't take your eye off your opponent. <laughs> and life is the same thing. But anyway, um, in Israel, one of the words we use for worship is hishtakawo. And hishtakawo means to bow down. So it's the custom in the East that one bowed themselves all the way down to the earth. Interestingly enough, Ghana, I see when they come before the Nanonom, people will do respect. They will bow towards the Nanonom. Or if they're in cloth, they will unveil their shoulder. The unveiling of the shoulder, if you ever observe in the king's court here, when other Nanonim come, they will unveil the shoulder to show that I come to you with an open heart. I have nothing concealed. I haven't concealed anything from you. I have no conspiracies. My heart is clean. So they'll do that as a symbolic gesture of uncovering that shoulder. And then you have, when I went to Nigeria, they have the closest to what we see in the East. In Nigeria, when you come before the kings there, or the chiefs there, you're on your knees or on your face. So you literally go down to your knees, or you prostrate yourself with your face on the floor. 
until you were commanded to rise up and to get up. And um, so I say that because that is our Eastern culture, because when you see what Abraham did, he went down and bowed himself down to the ground in front of the three strangers that were approaching. If you ever hear anyone who was old enough to tell you um, that His Majesty Abraham and Selassie's court, you hear a long corridor, I have to go to Ethiopia after the overthrow, but they have now turned his whole, camp, his whole compound into a university campus. So they will still tell you the palace is here, even though it's an administrative building. So when you go inside of the palace, you see the court room that he used to sit in state. And probably from this wall all the way to probably midway to the house, the corridor, maybe even to the fence wall down there, you will see that is his court inside of his, I guess, hall. So you see him sit, the throne is all the way down the far end. And always on his throne, he had live lions on both sides. So you had to be in awe entering into his palace and figure out how you're going to march down there, you know, to greet him with these two lions that you pray and attain. And so, but subjects of his could not walk down there. They had to crawl down there to approach his majesty. Because it's not Ross, Tafari, Makonan. It's His Majesty, Emperor Haile Selassie the First, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the conquering line of Judah. So in the cultural sense, the closest thing that you will come to seeing God will be in the person of the king. Because the word Melech means messenger, one sent. One who's in the place of somebody who God has ordained. The West took all this from us. So many nations in the East have that culture. That's why he and Nana is carrying the parrot wing. It's symbolic. Nana is the son. Nana is God. Nana is a living ancestor. Nana has the name, the 6th, the 12th, the 13th, because he's not the person that you went to school with. He's not the person that you grew up with. That person died and was born again in the cultural sense and made into an ancestor, and that's why he sits as Nana so-and-so, the 11th or the 12th or the 13th. And that's why any of the kings who sat on the throne of Israel, they were David. They were the manifestation of David because it was David's throne. And the Most High said, I will never ever cease to have a son sitting on that throne. So what we might see is man worship or something. It can only be that if it condescended in the minds of the people to worship the object and not the spirit that the object represented. But in the higher sense, it never condescended to you worship an individual or man. It was, rep it was, it was the station and what it represented. So I'm saying that to say it was customary all over the East. I made the story sometime, I always repeat, I repeat it again, how when the Americans dropped the bomb on Nagasaki and Hiroshima, that is not what broke the spirit of the Japanese and made them surrender. I mean, they negotiated around that travesty. They had to talk about surrendering to save lives. But the generals understood very well that the Japanese spirit had not been broken. And they calculated amongst themselves that we cannot break the Japanese spirit into total surrender until we break their spiritual system and have their emperor, Hirohito, be seen as a human being. Because they see him as a god. And how did they do that? They made him sign the articles of surrender on an American warship dressed in American clothes in between two white men. And they made him shake their hand. So General MacArthur and the other top general that was there and made him sign those papers. They made Hirohito stand in between them in an American suit with a white shirt and a tie, which means that any time the embodiment, the leader of your people is outside of his regalia, outside of his culture, he's misrepresenting the ancestors. You hear what I said? Yeah. Whenever you see a traditional leader that is held up in the eyes of his people as a traditional leader spiritually, and you see him out of culture, he's misrepresenting the ancestors. 
and there's things that you have to do to make that up. So what they did was, when the Japanese people saw their king, who was the embodiment of the rising sun, that's what the red circle on the Japanese flag means. That's the sun. That's the land of the rising sun. But the emperor is the embodiment, not the flag. The emperor is the real symbol of the soul of the people. So they had to get him to put on an American suit, a white shirt, a tie, American shoes, and have him stand between two white men and sign a document and then show him shaking their hands. The average Japanese citizen could never put their eyes on the emperor. They weren't allowed to look at the emperor. No more than you can stare at the sun more than a few seconds. That's what the culture said. And that's the culture they wanted to break down. So that is the Eastern culture versus the Western culture. So when we understand it in those terms, then some of these things that we read, we can put it in perspective. Why did Abraham bow down? Because that was customary in that day to do that, especially when you were reading someone of stature and someone of substance. So as we say that term, he's top of all, and abed. Abed means serve, to serve to work, above. So we have a number of words that enter, exchange themselves when we use the term worship. One of the words is, again, to work, to serve, to be a servant. But this one, he's talking about, means to bow down, to prostrate oneself. So this is the, this is where the Muslims take that culture from the Hebrew, because they also culturally are Hebrew, because Ishmael was a Hebrew, he was a Hebrew Israelite, like we are Hebrew Israelite. But the culture is the same, it's just that we end up surrendering to the culture, praying like this, or maybe praying on your knees, but actually we used to prostrate all the way down ground when we pray and when we worship the most high. And that was the way we also greeted each other as someone of great substance. So Abraham went out, he asked them would they eat and would they drink? And they said, okay, as you said, so do it. So he slaughtered the calf, made his wife make some bread, put some milk and cheese and ate it. This became one of the big scriptures of arguing uh, in the Hebrew culture too. Um, we have elements that, in our culture, that believe in the kosher law. I tell you kosher is not a Hebrew word, it's a Yiddish word, but we use it. And they say to be kosher, one of the things that you have to do to be kosher is not only do you stay away from certain um, flesh or animals and eat a certain way, but to be kosher under the Edomite standard of culture they say that you actually have to have separate dishes. You have dishes for dairy products, and you have dishes for meat products. So when a European Jew asks you, do you keep a kosher home, they mean that you have separate uh, plates and separate culinary for your dairy products and your meat products. And they hold you to line to them for that. You even have some of them who won't eat in your house if you don't keep your house that way. Never mind about eating and not keeping any unclean food. It has nothing to do with that. But it's the ritual of following the religion of Judaism. But many of us who did not uh, conform to that by it being Torah used to use this scripture as an example. That didn't Abraham serve uh, the Melochim, the angels, the Nazim, the men? Did he serve them milk and meat at the same time? They had no problem eating. Now, for the dietary law, we say that your digestive system doesn't digest dairy products and milk well at the same time. And so it's like being a vegetarian. If you just want to be healthier, you want to improve upon your diet, then you can be conscious of that, of not taking dairy products with beef or red meat. But it doesn't mean that you've broken the law if you do, and it should be, it should be that understanding. And even though this preceded the law of Moses, even where they extract that precept from, comes from thou shall not seat a kid in his mother's milk. And that is interpreted as if it has to deal with a dietary reference. When that had to deal more with a practice that was happening amongst the Canaanite people that they did and it was an act of cruelty. 
because we were not allowed to even slaughter a goat and its kid on the same day. What we mean by that, you can't take an adult goat and slaughter it for a festival and the same day slaughter its child. And that's animal cruelty too. So even though they're goats and even though you can eat goat meat, you're not supposed to take a goat mother and its child and slaughter them the same day and feast and roast on them and, and, and enjoy on them. So when we say thou shalt not seat a kid in his mother's milk, that was also something that was used as what we used to say, um, a kind of like a Canaanite potion. Uh, I don't want to use the term witchcraft because it's so common. But it was anyway a part of something that they used to do um, that was not customary for Israelites to follow. And calling uh, a kid, a young goat, in his own mother's milk to make the meat more tender. But it's an act of cruelty. But many of our scholars and sages have taken it out of context and said that is what it means. You should not eat milk, meat, and, and uh, cheese together. In other words, you should not have a cheeseburger. <laughs> In the simplest terminology, you know. So I say for dietary reasons, it's a good practice for your digestive system. And so I encourage it for that, but not because it is the way you interpret that scripture in the law. And it's just that different than there. So you see, again, as I started out, this is where we get the famous statement, the hospitality of Abraham. So any Hebrew that shows up anywhere is not supposed to be a stranger when he shows up at your house. Because you're supposed to show him the full level of hospitality, as we see Abba Abraham did in this scripture with the three men he had never seen. Now when they get into the conversation, you see that they came to give him a serious message. And that's why I say you don't know who you're entertaining at any given time. But the angel is not going to fly down from the sky as a bird and then rest on your chair and turn into a man. And, um, or somebody flying around with negligee on the wings, you know, and you say, that must be an angel. Wow, you know, I haven't seen nothing like that before. You know, it comes in the person of a human being, a messenger. Angel simply means messenger. Malak. Malak. Malachi is my messenger. That's where the word Malachi comes from. My messenger. So when you entertain people every day, as what I said, beware of strangers that you entertain because you may entertain angels unaware. And when a stranger comes into your household, in the days before we had television and Netflix and smartphones and social media, you know, news didn't travel as fast as today. So when a stranger came to your house, you consider that a blessing. So what news are you bringing from afar? Oh, tell me what's happening in Accra. Tell me what's happening in America. Tell me what's happening in the part of the world you came from. So you greeted them like they do here. You give them some water, give them something to drink. After the water, you ask them, can I serve you anything else? Or you take some bira, some soda, whatever. Um, or you take something to eat. And then you ask their mission. That is the everyday culture here that is slipping away. So now you're lucky if it's every other day culture. Or maybe, you know, sometimes in the week culture. It used to be everyday culture, but it's not every day now. When I first landed here 30 something years ago, every house you went to, when you went there, they sat you down, they gave you water, then they gave you something else to drink, offered you some food, then asked you your mission. Even when they know the mission, they ask you your mission. And that is the culture that we see being displayed here. And you'll see it, the mission of the three men will be explained to Abraham what they've come for. And you'll see some sharp negotiation going on here um, in this chapter. And you see some of the culture brilliantly being testified to and on display. So, as it said, Verse 6, and Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it and make cakes. So many of us know that this is unleavened bread. So the unleavened bread, this is the bread that we make in haste and quickly. 
some even suggest that it was the time of the Passover, even though it was no Passover, it was still the time of the spring time. And I'll uh, show you how cycles move in sequence. And so in that respect, he gave Sarah that order. And unto, Ab and unto the herd ran Abraham and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the lad. And he said, hasten to dress it. And he took the curd, cheese, and milk, and the calf, which he addressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to this time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard in the door of the tent, which was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and well stricken in age. It had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women, which means she no longer had a monthly cycle, which meant that she already passed her menopause, which meant she was not supposed to be able to bear. Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am wax old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said unto, and Jehovah said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I have a surety, shall I of a surety bear a child or old? Is anything too hard for Jehovah? At the set time I will return unto thee, according to this time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not. But she was afraid. Do you see the tone of the men changed? And she realized these are not ordinary men. These men have brought a prophecy. First she realized that I didn't say anything and they heard me. How did they hear what I had to say and I said it in my mind? I didn't say it with my mouth. And yet they perceived. How did they even know I was listening in? Because she wasn't in the room. She wasn't invited into the conversation. He just asked, where was she? He said, she's in the tent. But she was listening to the conversation. And she was speaking from within our heart. And yet they heard her. And then they said with a determination that Sarah, according to the time of life, next year will be with a son. So that's a prophecy. So in that respect, she had to know these are not ordinary men. That's what he said, no, no, no. I, I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. No, I, I, I didn't laugh. You know, yeah, but thou didn't laugh. No, don't go any further. It's not while you're ahead. It says, Then Sarah denied, saying, I laughed not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. Mm -hmm. And the men rose up from them and looked out towards Sodom. And Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. Now you see, uh, that was one mission that was complete, but they're on a multitask mission. The multitask mission was, first and foremost, I'm bringing the news to you, Abraham, that the Most High God has decided to bless you with a son from your wife, Sarah. I know you're satisfied already, but you got a son, Ishmael. So now you feel you have, you're a man, and you got somebody to inherit you. But Sarah has not been fulfilled yet. And we want Sarah to have a son. We want you to have a son with Sarah. So that was the mission of one of the angels. That's why we'll see later that the three angels turned into two. The reason why they turned into two is because one angel had fulfilled his task when he told Abraham the mission about him having a son with Sarah. His mission was over. So it wasn't a matter of saying, let me hang out with y'all while you do your thing. So you see only two angels would enter into Sodom. And the third one, as I said, had completed his task. So there was no need for him to go there. Interestingly enough, one of the Kabbalistical uh, interpretations of the opening of this scripture uh, is that the term in Hebrew, in lo, three men, if you add up all the Hebrew letters in that statement, those letters equal to the same numerical value as the name of the angels, Mikael, Gabriel, and Raphael. Same numerical value. So in a way, it has a way of 
identifying which of the, which of the, these powerful angels that uh, visited uh, Abraham in that message. So we see that they looked towards Sodom. It said, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that which I am doing, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and in him shall be blessed all the nations of the earth. So you know there's another prophecy that says, um, the Lord does not do anything without first revealing it unto his prophets. Like anything that God does in this earth, one way, shape, form, or another, one of his prophets will have that revelation and to be able to give the insight to the people of God that this is the vision that I had, this is the dream that I had, but this is what this is, the, this is what I got, the message I got from the Most High. Somebody will have seen it or heard it. That the Most High is fair in all of his things. That's why I say, first comes truth, then comes judgment. The Most High will never come and bring judgment upon a place without having served truth upon that place first. And the people have no choice of choosing truth versus rejecting it before judgment can be made. So, in that respect, we see that this is the beginning, not the beginning, but another one of the testimonies of the assurance of the Abrahamic covenant, as people say. The Abrahamic covenant. The, group, the nations that are most predominant today in the world are the nations that basically um, are under the Abrahamic covenant. Whether they are Christians, whether they are Hebrews, whether they are Muslims, it's because of Abraham that they trace their blessings. And that's why we call the Abrahamic covenant. Some say the Abrahamic religion. But the Abrahamic blessing and covenant, the grip, that we understand that is viable and powerful and possible for which we stand under that umbrella. It says, For I have known him to the end, that he may command his children and his household after him, that they may keep the way of Jehovah to do righteousness and justice, to the end that Jehovah may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. So you see, one of the things the Most High basically looks to all of us to do is to try to make sure we instruct our children and our pedigree in this way of life. And brings about the continuity of it. We're always supposed to make sure we have all of our children get to an age where they are in charge of themselves, where they make their own choices, where they do their own thing. But you're supposed to make sure that you've done your job by making sure that foundation is there and they know the truth and they know the difference between right and wrong. When you've done that, you're released. Not that you're released that you don't ever stop counseling. You don't ever stop advising. But you know you've done your job by at least giving them that foundation, giving them that instruction, giving them that counsel. And you always stay in their ear. Because they can't get away from you. Because still in life, it's the parents who bless the children, not the children who bless the parents. So many parents today have surrendered their position to their children. And their children are ruling them and telling them what to do. And, um, <laughs> I don't have to go any further, you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But it is not the order of things, and it's the reason why so many things are out of order. Mm -hmm. So, in that respect, we see that Abraham got this blessing because God was assured that he would teach his children and his children's children. And this thing stayed consistent because the way we have received this book, we receive it like linear chronologically. So we don't sometimes realize the overlapping of the ages that Levi, the son of Israel, knew Abraham. That's his great grandfather. And he spent some years with him. We forget that the overlapping of the children, we look like it was this Abraham, then he went, and then Isaac, then he went, and then Jacob, then he went, and Jacob's 12 sons. But they overlapped generations. They knew their grandfathers. They knew their great-grandfathers. And they made sure the teaching stayed in line. And that they stayed circumspect. And so therefore, 
That is the reason that God saw that in Abraham, that he would not fail to teach his children that he was able to get that blessing. Even there's a great story of Abraham and Ishmael. Because when Abraham had to dismiss Ishmael from his home, oh, he grew up and he left him. And they said that one day Abraham went on a journey and he went to go visit his son Ishmael to see how he was doing. And that day Ishmael had gone out hunting. He left the family with his wife. And Abraham came up on his camel, came up on the camp of his, of his wife. She didn't know Abraham. This is where the story goes. And Abraham said, oh, no, he's the man of the household home. He said, oh, he's gone out. He's been gone a few days. He went out to do some hunting in the field. And he said, is there some water in the house that I can quench my thirst? And also the thirst of my camel. So, oh, yes, we have some water, real cool water in the well there, and the bucket is right there. And you can help yourself. And you can have all that you would desire to drink. He got down on his camel. He went to the well. He took some water. He got some water for his camel. And he observed that the mother was insulting some of the children and correcting them. You know how some of us can be. Get your behind over there. We don't say behind. We say the other ass. Over here and sit down and shut up like I told you. And he recognized the mannerism whereby he's instructing the children. So he decided to say, okay, now I'm about to leave. And when your husband returns, tell him that an old man came by. And that the old man observed that the peg in his tent was a little weak, that he should replace that peg and put a strong one there. And not knowing that this is a parable and a way that Abraham used to be rehearsed with his son. So when Ishmael came home, and he asked the wife, so what has happened when I was gone? Did anybody come through, any strangers come through? He said, nothing but an old man, an old man with a camel. He said, he had, he had to describe him. When she described him, he was like, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. So did he say anything or give any message? We didn't really say much, you know? Um, I told him he asked for some water for himself and the camel. I told him to help himself. The water was there, free. And that, um, he did say something that I didn't know he talked about. He said, the peg in your tent for the week, and that uh, you should replace it. And he said, you don't know that that was my father. And you know what he was telling me? He was telling me the peg is you. You're the woman of my household. And that the woman of my household is weak. And not holding the standard. And that I should replace it. <laughs> She's a bit of you. So it just so happened that Ishmael on another wife too. And Abraham paid a visit after about a year. Came there the same ritual. Only this time he was greeted properly, served water, water served to his camels, he was offered a meal, he was entertained, well, begged to spend a night, of which he said he wouldn't, but at least all was offered to him. And he gave the exact same parable to the woman. But Ishmael wasn't there. He said, Tell him the peg in his tent is strong. Don't be moving. Keep it. <laughs> so it's um, again it goes back to that lesson that everybody learned, the hospitality of Abraham. And even though we're not talking about Isaac, we're not talking about Jacob, but Ishmael was the son of Abraham. So he had to know the culture. He had to be taught. There was no imbalance around sharing that knowledge and information. So in that respect, it is always that we know. Um, I grew up in New York, but I had to always visit my grandparents in the South of North Carolina. And even we brought the Southern culture up to New York in the first generation, that it was an offense when you went to somebody's house and they offered you something to eat and you refused. But everybody offered you some food. They offered you some drink. They wanted to make sure you're all right. It was just our normal culture. Like, that's how we live. That's how we support one another. You know, you have your friends over your house, your friends are automatically served. Not, you know, you call in the kitchen one by one, eat your food, fast, and go back out there with your friends. But it ain't enough. It was never that way. So we see the culture of what we inherited is very important. And the culture with our young people is very important. Because 
the way our young people in the house, they know how to come and serve water. There's a way you serve water to guests. There's a way to see that they have enough. You need some more. All these things were done in little children coming up. But these things have been compromised because of social media and telephones and television and, foreign, and viewing foreign culture. That our children don't know how to serve no more. You gotta ask them before you get it. It used to be automatic. If you're a stranger, you're a traveler, you came and you sat down, they say, get some water. Now they say, get up, get up from that TV and serve them the water. Now you have to instruct. It used to be automatic. So now we see, we're getting ready to go. We just mentioned for the first time Sodom. We're getting ready to go into Sodom and Gomorrah. And this lesson this week. Now we're in that hot water in Ghana. We're in that hot water in Ghana. Around, I can't pronounce all the letters. I do know the first three, L, G, B, Q, T. Every time I try to get it, I can't get it right. Let's go pick it up. We don't want to get it right. Oh, come on, bro. Hey, L, B, G, T. Yeah, Q, right. Well, they throw it, they throw that. They said, don't leave nothing out. I'm saying that because my younger generation has to come up with a gray area. You haven't, you haven't been taught in black and white. You've been taught in a gray area. And that all these things are mixed up, They're mixed up mm -hmm. priorities and principles. And nothing is new under the sun. The reason why you have laws against sodomy is because of this scripture called Sodom. It has a history. So it ain't nothing new. It ain't a matter of your parents being old, and they don't know no better, and they, they're old generation, a new generation, and all of that. It's not about that. It's not about teaching no hate about anybody, but it's about being straight and clear about night and day. And so we're getting ready to go into what we call cultural arguments. The West does not want to respect that anybody else has a culture except the West. They want to call their culture, culture, and not their culture. As if there's no other culture. Other people don't have culture. As if there's one culture. The only culture is McDonald's, and Coca-Cola, and Fanta. There's no such thing as Pito, and Palm Wine. And it's only what they say is the going thing, is the going thing, and nothing else exists. And then by fall, so Ghana has to be aware, very aware, this is no time to rejoice, even if the parliament votes on the law that is pending. Not gonna be a time to stand up and rejoice that we did it, we got a law. It's like knocking down a big man in a ring and you turn your back before the referee counted them out. <laughs> and then, you're up there rejoicing, I knocked him down, I knocked him down, I won. And you knocked him, and you turn around and boom, he done knocked you out. Because you didn't, you didn't see that he was knocked out. You didn't hear that he was counted out. So if Ghana is prepared to stand up, which she should, she has to be prepared to receive all the wrath that America and the West will bring on her for standing up for the right thing. These MPs got to be prepared to tighten up their belt. They ain't going to be flying abroad for no foreign health care. They're going to have to go to the hospital in Ghana. They ain't going to be flying abroad for all these amenities to be getting treated like they're separate from their people. They're going to be treated as their people, which should be anywhere. But it's not going to be no false knockdown, no false victory. And don't think that the West ain't prepared to go to war. And it's good because we need to know where we're at and what time it is and be prepared to go the whole way because we're fighting for our very life for our very existence these people are already flying up to somewhere up there in the galaxies messing up more and they have messed this earth up and messed up all the cultures of the earth the elements 
fire, water, earth, air. Hmm. Everything out of season. And it's not just because of global warming. That's an issue. It's because of man's errant ways with the divine order of the universe that we turn the universe upside down on its head. So in that respect, let us just continue to see what we have in store. It says, verse 20, And Yehovah said, Verily the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and verily their sin is exceedingly grievous. I will go down now and see whether according to the cry of it which has come unto me, they have done. So you see how just God is. He doesn't move on Roma. The first says that the cry of Sodom has come up to me. And I heard it. And it's grievous. But I won't go on the Roma. I will still go down and examine and check for myself if what I've heard is true. If it's correct. And if it is, then I'll know what to do. It says, I will now go down and see, and whether according to the cry of it which is come unto me, they have done. Destruction shall come upon them, and if not, I will know. And the men turned from thence and went towards Sodom. And Abraham stood yet before Yehoah. And Abraham drew nigh and said, Wilt thou indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Because he knew that his nephew Lot was there. And he knew that the place was wicked. And he knew that the rumors that the Most High God had heard were true. And he knew that when he went over to Sodom, he was going to see that it was true. And he's going to destroy that city. And he said, my nephew was there. So before that judgment, let me try to plead in behalf of my nephew that he might be spared. So he said, Lord, if it be, perhaps, there are 50 righteous within the city, wilt thou indeed sweep away and not forgive the place for the fifty righteous that are therein that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked so that the righteous should be as the wicked that be far from thee shall the judge of all the earth do not do justly so Abraham said no Lord is the chief negotiator if you find fifty people in the city that are righteous Will you destroy the whole place, even the 50, along with the wicked? That's not just, that's not you. So I know, Lord, if you find 50 people in the city, won't you spare the whole city for the 50? And most I said, yes, I will do that. If, you, if I find 50 people there who are faithful and righteous, I will spare the whole city for 50 people. And Jehovah said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will forgive all the place for their sake. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Who am I but dust and ashes? Perhaps there shall lack of the fifty righteous five. No doubt destroy for the lack of five of all the city. And he said, hmm, Will not destroy it if I find there forty-five. So you see Abraham Serious negotiator broke it down to 50. He said, But suppose that 50 is lacking 10 percent, like five. <laughs> Go to most high, destroy the city because five are lacking. Now, forget the whole city now. You know, broke it down like, to five. Five people missing out of the 50, you will still destroy the whole city. He says, And he continued yet to speak unto him and said, Perhaps this shall be fine, there 40. And he said, I will not do it for the sake of 40. And he said, oh, let not Jehovah be angry, and I will speak. Perhaps there shall be found there 30. And he said, I will not do it if I find there 30. And he said, behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Perhaps there shall be found there 20. And he said, I will not do it for 20, for the sake of 20. And he said, oh, let not the anger of the Lord be kindled against me. And I will speak, but yet this once. I won't say nothing else after this. Perhaps this shall be found in the intent. And he said, I will not destroy it 
for the sake of the tent. And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left off speaking to Abraham. Abraham said, now listen, I know a lot. You got to have a wife or two. You got to have children, two, three, four, five. At least if he kept his own household in order, it's got to be 10. And if he got 10, at least of his own family members, the city's got to be saved. So I think I've done my best by him now. I pray he's done the rest. I pray he can hold up to the rest. I've got this thing down to 10. That's why in most of the Hebrew camps, we always use a term we call minion. And a minion is 10, usually men. And they won't bring the Torah scroll out of the ark to read the Torah if there's not 10 men present. But we always say, at least in our area, we should be able to find 10 men who love the study of the Torah. Mm -hmm. And will come out and study. We don't know when the Most High may be in there and say, let me judge this town. Mm -hmm. But for the sake of 10 men praying and studying the word, the city can be spared. And not leaving out you sisters. You too are counted in that number. Can you get 10 people, 10 righteous? Didn't just say people, I said righteous. Can I get 10 of the righteous? 10 of the righteous can hold together a whole city, a whole town, a whole state. If you got some righteous people there gathered together. So I like this negotiation because I learned to negotiate with this even with merchants. You know, in New York, they used to have centers. A lot of Jews control the economy and all of that. And you know, we're very young. One of the first businesses I had was a uh, retail business. You know, selling my artwork and men's clothes. And so we used to go down to the wholesale district. And you learn when you go down to the wholesale district. Even in New York today, they got districts in New York and probably every other major center. Look up to New York and say they can't sell to you retail. It's against the law because their neighbors three blocks down is selling something for $300 retail. One item that you can buy a dozen for for $300. So you can't come and shop in those stores unless you have a wholesaler's license and you're buying wholesale. But for those of us who know how to negotiate, you go into the store and you say, sir, these shirts here, how much is a gross? Then he knows you're in the right place. But well, you're going to talk about the gross is 12 dozen. And then you're going to say, well, the gross is $144. So you deduct, okay, that's $12 a dozen. So does that mean that a half a gross is 72? Um, okay, half a gross is 72. Okay, so that means if I've got a dozen, that's 12, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, no, I don't want to say. I said, no, but you said the price is like that. No, you go like that because you ask for one shirt, you're going to tell you the one shirt is $60. But you didn't ask for the gross. So if you ask for the gross, and then you start to deduct your way and walk your way and walk your way, you don't ever let them know you want to buy two pieces. You make them at least think you're going to buy a dozen. And then you try to get away with getting out of that dozen what you want to buy. So you negotiate from the same principle. And truthfully speaking, the art is still there. In West Africa, they say, and you need, many of you read a lot of history, especially when you trace the Hebrews, they direct you to certain ethnic groups in Africa. So the two outstanding business groups that they identify in West Africa are the Asante and the Igbo. The Asante of Nigeria and the Igbo, I mean, Asante of Ghana and the Igbo of Nigeria. They say they are experts with bartering and doing business, and they actually got the name for the business as the black Jews of West Africa. Only because they know the Jews are the shrewdest European businessmen. And they use it as that example. But you see here, when you go to the East, there's no joke. Some of the uh, experiences I had in Egypt especially, there is the way they can sell you a product you don't have in your mind buying it, and you don't even want it. And by the time they finish with you, you say, give it to me. Yeah, just give it to me. They, they, they know how to peddle an item and how to sit you down and just lure you into the product and just 
find you into the fire. But you see Abraham at his best and dealing with the angels here. So it says, and Abraham returned unto this place. Hallelujah. And it says, Wabau Shinei Malakim. And the two angels came to Sodom at evening, one for mercy and one for judgment. And I said, we started off with three angels. One angel was just to announce to Abraham the blessing of a son to be born to Sarah. So he left. Now there's two angels left. One of these angels for judgment, one of these angels for mercy. If they had found the tent, then the angel of mercy would have prevailed. Not having found the ten, then the angel of judgment prevailed. And so this is why you see only two. It says, And Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot saw them, and rose up to meet them, and he fell down on his face to the earth. That's what we say again, Wayishkahu, meaning to bow down to the earth. You see the custom and the culture? Abraham did the exact same thing coming from the culture, his nephew Lot did the exact same thing. It says, and he said, Behold now, Adonai, my Lord, turn aside, I pray you, into the house of your servant. Tarry all night, and wash your feet, and ye shall rise up early. Now you see, you have to be careful with some of these books that we buy, and these commentaries. I'm reading from a Hebrew script. They have a lot of Jewish commentary here. But their Jewish commentary is also filled with their racist slants inside there. And so, you see, when Abraham told them they're going to wash their feet, they put down here that the Arabs used to worship the dust on their feet. And because they worship the dust on their feet, Abraham wanted them to wash off that dust so they wouldn't bring idol worship into his house. <laughs> what kind of madness? Because they are basically Eurocentric in their references and ideals, but well, these commentaries were written years ago, before they got familiar with the land of Israel and got more familiar with Eastern culture over these last 60 or so years. When you see people who comment in some of these commentaries, like Rashi, Rashi's commentary and all that, these are Jews who have basically a European reference. Now they've been in the land of Israel for over 60 years. So now they've gotten a little more accustomed to Eastern culture and what it is to live in the East. But this commentary is written at a time when it's common for us to wash feet when you walk with sandals and walk barefoot. As a basic custom, like we say, we wash hands. It's more likely that the odds are your hands can be cleaner than your feet when you didn't walk with shoes. Because you can walk on anything and walk anywhere. You don't bring it into your household. That's why the custom all over Africa and all over the East is take off your shoes when you go into the house. It is the West and the Occidental culture that say take off your hat. Well, your head didn't go nowhere, most likely. <laughs> I'm not going to say they didn't go nowhere with some people. But the likelihood is that your head is cleaner than your feet. So what are you taking off your hat for? I know what they say. But everywhere you see, take off your shoes. That's sacred. Moses was told, take off your sandals, come off your feet on the mount. He said, because the ground that you're standing on is sacred ground. Joshua was told when he met the angel before going into the holy land, take off your sandals and off your feet, for the place where you're standing is holy. So we always know what it is to remove your shoes from off your feet, and we know what it is to offer water, not water, for the traveler to wash his feet, but for you to wash his feet and feet washing. That was a custom that we had in the East. A custom that many of our forefathers follow. I told somebody the other day, my, my brother's here and my cousin is not here. We share the same uh, grandfather on his mother's side, my father's side. And I was we were talking the other day and I asked him at the table. I said, I never ever in my life remember my papa, my grandfather, with shoes on. In North Carolina, every time I visit, he's walking back with me. Uh, the soles of my feet, not like the soles of his feet, but I'm sure the soles of his feet, that's all, that's like leather. Well, he had thick callus under there. 
but I never saw what a pair of shoes on. Now I'm sure that probably when he went to church, but that's how our people in the South equated shoes. You put on shoes to go to church on Sunday. But you don't put on shoes and be walking during the week and all that. You have no shoes on. So that culture can last all the way up to me knowing my grandfather like that. Then that means that's an old culture that people walk without shoes. And to have a pair of shoes on was for a special occasion. It wasn't at all occasion. So even where some of you now you got Kentucky Fried Chicken coming here, and you got takeaway boxes. You see the takeaway box? I'm talking to my young people. You know the takeaway container? It wasn't always in plastic foam. It used to be takeaway box. Even some people still call it takeaway box, even though it's styrofoam. It's a takeaway box. You know where that come from? It comes from a time in the United States when we were young, that we could not go eat in a restaurant with white people. So when you were traveling on a road for 10 hours, 12 hours, 15 hours, when you see a place to eat, you couldn't stop there and order food, but they won't serve you. But they would tell you that there's a window around the back and you can go get a takeaway. But those of our parents who didn't want to be embarrassed like that, what they would do is cook their own food before they would go on the road. Many of us, when you went back to the village, we call it down south. Here you would say going back to the village. Your parents want to give the impression that you were making it in the big city. Like if you're living in Accra, and you haven't seen your parents who live in the village. When you go see them in the village, you want to dress up well. You want to make it look like you're making it in Accra. I'm making it. I'm living in Accra. I'm making it big. I'm making it. I'm living in Kumasi. I'm making it big. So you wouldn't bought a new pair of shoes. You got new dress. You put them on. So we take our shoe box. But we buy. You have to have a new pair of shoes to go home. And you take the shoe box and you line it up with some tissue paper and you put your chicken and your pound cake in the box. That was your takeaway. That's what you had in your car. That's the food you ate when you were going on a journey. So when people started frying chicken and they want the chicken to taste good like black folks have it, they say serve it in a box. So that's the way black people have their chicken in a shoe box when they travel. That's like your takeaway. Now there's a such thing as a custom takeaway. Everybody say takeaway box. They don't know where the takeaway box comes from. And um, when we go down south, we always had our chicken and our pound cake in the shoe box. But we went down there, you had to show your children that new pair of shoes, even though you didn't, you know, you, you wanted your, your grand, your, your father wanted your grandmother to know that, look, my children are doing well, got new shoes on, I got me a new pair of shoes, I got a new car. The car might have been very borrowed from his friend. But he had to show up down south with a nice car, with a nice pair of shoes, because even to this day, sisters of the old school, a woman, will still look at the kind of shoes a man is wearing. Mm -hmm see what kind of man he is, see what kind of shoes he's wearing. You ever see that movie, um, I think it was, um, What's Love Got to Do With It? Ike and Tina Turner. And when Tina's mother saw Ike outside with that fancy car, he came to pick up Tina from the house. And she didn't really like him. But she looked at him out there, he was driving a convertible car. And the next thing the camera went on was his shoes. The man got a good pair of shoes on, driving a convertible car. Well, I think I'll talk to him a little bit. Let me see what he got to say about my daughter. And then, of course, the, the, the big thing was he went in that pocket and got a roll. And so I said, okay, well, is she going to sing that good? <laughs> I love it. But you have to understand the culture to understand the subtleties of what the camera was showing. And that was the subtleties. So in that respect, we understand that. We, again, our culture is our salvation and has kept us throughout the years. And it is an ancient culture. So the washing of feet, you know, is something that lasts throughout the years. And I remember Rabbi Matthews and all of them, and their old uh, Passover ceremony, they used to do a feet washing ceremony during the Passover. So now that has been cut out of the ritual. But being that, being too associated with the new covenant or the new 
Testament, because that's what Yeshua and his disciples were supposed to have done at the Passover when they called the Last Supper. They washed all the feet. But it, it predates them, as you can see. This is Genesis. This predated Yahshua or any of the disciples. They were only following a custom that was ancient. And it goes back as far as here. It says that he argued and he urged them greatly. Verse 3. And he urged them greatly, and they turned in unto him, and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and did break unleavened bread, and they did eat. So you see, here they mention unleavened bread. With Abraham, they didn't mention unleavened bread, but I suggested it. That was probably unleavened bread, they do it in haste. But before they laid down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round about, both young and old, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot, and said unto him, We are the men that came in to the tonight. Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. And Lot went out unto them, to the door, and he shut the door after him. And he said, I pray you, my brother, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters that have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. But as much as they are come under the shadow of my roof. Again, you see the custom? One of the reasons, one of the questions they ask you in Ghanaian culture, when they serve you the water and they ask your mission, they also ask, is anybody chasing you? Is anybody after you? Because now that you're under my roof, I have to offer you protection. That's the culture. That's the tradition. And I emphasize that slipping away, that must be grasped that it doesn't slip away. It's disappearing. It's becoming strange. And we have to add value back to it. That it's not lost. And they said, stand back. And they said, this one fellow came in who sojourned, and he will need to play the judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. So obviously, they have not accepted Lot as one of them. Now they're saying Lot is a stranger. Here you are a stranger in our midst, and now you're going to tell us what to do? Now we're going to deal with you. Worse we're going to deal with them. And they press saw upon the man, even Lot, and do not to break the door. But the men put forth their hand and brought Lot to them into the house. And, the, and they shut the door. And the men that were at the door of the house, they smoked with blindness both small and great, till they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said to Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? You hear that? Do you have anybody here besides your son-in-law and your son and your daughters? I say that because we all know the story that Lot and his two daughters were saved. What happened to the son? What happened to the sons-in-law? They didn't make it. And whoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of the place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is once great before Jehovah. And Jehovah have sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out and spoke unto his sons-in-law. You hear this? Well, Lot went out and talked to his son-in-laws, who married his daughters. And he said, Up. Ah, Go you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy the city. But he seemed as one that jest and made jokes in the eyes of his sons-in-law. And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters that are found here. Lest thou be swept away in the iniquity of the city. But he lingered. He didn't just linger. He lingered trying to convince the rest of his family. He lingered trying to convince his in-laws. Time is short. And he lingered so much that even he would have been caught up if the angels didn't take him out. And that shows you what can happen easily, even to this day. And he lingered. And the men laid hold upon his hand, and upon the hand of his wife, and upon the hand of his two daughters. 
and the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth, and sent him without the city. And it came to pass, when they had when they had them forth abroad, he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. To the mountain escape, lest thou be swept away. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold now, thy servant hath found grace in thy sight, and thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast shown unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest the evil overtake me, and I die. Behold now, this city is dead to flee unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape there. Is it not a little one, and my soul shall live? And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, but I will not overthrow the city of which thou hast spoken. Hasten thou, and escape there, for I cannot do anything till thou become there. And therefore was called the city of Zoar. And the sun was risen upon the earth, when Lot came into Zoar. Then the Lord caused the rain upon Sodom and Gomorrah, fire, brimstone, and fire from Jehovah out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities in all the plain, and all the inhabitants of the city, and the growth of the ground. But his wife looked back from behind them, and she became a pillar of salt. And Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he had stood before Jehovah, and he looked out toward Sodom and Gomorrah and toward all the land of the plain. And beheld, and lo, the smoke of the land went up as the smoke of a furnace. And it came to pass, when Elohim destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham, and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrew the cities in which Lot dwelt. And Lot went up out of Zoar, and dwelt in the mountain, and his two daughters with him, for he feared dwell in Zoar, and he dwelt in a cave, he and his two daughters. And the firstborn said unto the younger, Our father is old, and there is not a man in the earth to come in unto us after the manner of all the earth. Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made their father drink wine that night, and the firstborn went in and lay with her father, and he knew not when she lay down, nor when she arose. And it came to pass on the morrow that the firstborn said unto the younger, Behold, I lay yesterday with my father. Let us make him wine, drink wine this night also, and come thou in, and he lie with him, that we may preserve seed of our father. And they made the drink that night also their father wine. And the younger rose and lay with him, and he knew not when she lay down, nor when she rose. Thus were, thus were with child both the daughters of Lot by their father. And the firstborn bore a son, and called his name Moab, meaning from the father. The same is the name of the father of the Moabites unto this day. And the younger, she also bore a son, and called his name Ben Ami, meaning son of my people. The same is the father of the children of Ammon unto this day. Hallelujah. I'm going to read straight from the last question. And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the land of the south and dwelt between Kadesh and between Shur. And he sojourned in Girah. And Abraham said to uh, Sarah, his wife, She is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. So you see, Abimelech was not the name of the king. It was a title, like saying Nana here. Like somebody calling you up and saying, yeah, Nana told me to tell you, you said, wait, 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 hold, hold, what Nana? You know how many Nanas we have in Ghana? Which Nana? So Abimelech means Abi is my father. Melech means king. So my father, the king, is the title of the rulers of Gerar. And any man who took on that title, or took on that station, became, took on that title. So there were many of them. They didn't know what he's talking about. The father, it's like power. Which power? So it's a title outside of a name. The 
says, But God came to Abimelech in a dream of the night and said to him, Behold, thou shalt die because of the woman whom thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And Abimelech had not come nigh her. And he said, Adonai, Jehovah, O Lord, wilt thou slay even a righteous man? Said he not himself unto me, She is my sister, Akotihi. And she, even she herself said, He is my brother. In the simplicity of my heart, and in the innocency of my hands, have I done this? So he knows exactly. You know, Lord, in the simplicity of my heart, and innocence in my hands, I, I didn't know what was going on. I didn't, you know, I, I, you know, they, they, they both lied to me. And the Most High said, but the God said to them, in the dream, yeah, I know that in the simplicity of thy heart, thou hast done this. And I also withheld thee from sinning against me. He said, it wasn't about the simplicity of your heart. Lord, the innocence of your hands. I withheld you from sinning against me. I stopped you. You would have taken the woman if I didn't stop you. So don't say nothing about your innocence. <laughs> so this is what the full tie is saying. You would have taken her that night if I didn't stop you in a dream and warn you if you touch her, you're a dead man. So what about your innocence and your pure heart? But I like to say to people, I want to go ahead and look at the name. And God, now therefore, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know thou that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are dying. And Abimelech rose early in the morning, and called all his servants, and told all these things in their ears. And the men were so afraid. And Abimelech called unto Abraham, and said unto him, what hast thou done unto us? And wherein hast I sinned against thee, that thou hast brought on me and on my kingdom a great sin? Deeds that ought not be done, thou hast done unto me. Now, see, in the piousness of our forefathers, trying to paint up who we are, people, they always try to say, because this is Abimelech or Pharaoh, children of Ham, but they didn't know God. But that's an exaggeration. It's not true. All the sons of Noah knew God. And what they're simply saying is that we don't do that thing here, Abraham. We don't take another man's wife. We don't live that way. So it's not Abraham who brought an understanding of God to these people. God has been existing from the beginning. And some people went astray, and some people maintained. But it's not that he had to bring the understanding of God. They say, you rather broke the law by giving up your wife as your sister, and almost caused us to err. If it wasn't for us knowing God, and God visiting me in a dream, and stopping me, I would have sinned and brought the sin upon this land by taking another man's wife. Which means they have understanding of culture and morality there. And a lot of the Hebrews don't want to, you know, surrender to that. And act like, you know, that was so. Now we just brought the understanding of God in the world. <laughs> God made this whole world. And he made Noah. He made Noah's sons. And he instructed all of them. Just as some listened, some didn't. Some maintained more. And some didn't. But it's not like they didn't know the law. The reason why they were judged as nations is because they knew the law and didn't do it. God can't judge you what you don't know. They knew the law and they didn't keep it. And that's why we said we would keep it. And that's why we're held to it. And that's the basis of our covenant. says, and Abimelech said unto Abraham, What sawest thou that thou hast done this thing? And Abraham said, Because I thought, you see that? Kiyomati, I thought surely there is no fear of God in this place. He didn't know. He didn't know where he was going. He said, Now he's acknowledged, but I see now you also know God or fear God. And they will slay me for my wife's sake. And moreover, indeed, she is my sister. The daughter of my father is she, but not the daughter of my mother. And so she became my wife. And it came to pass, when 
and God caused me to wander from my father's house. And I said unto her, This is the kindness which thou shalt do unto me at every place whither we shall come. Say of me, he is my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them a day for him and returned to him Sarah the wife. So he said, and Abimelech said, Behold, my land is before thee. Dwell where it pleaseth thee. And unto Sarah he said, Behold, I have given a thousand pieces of silver to thy brother. Behold, it is for thee a covering of the eyes of all that are with thee. And before all men thou art right. Hallelujah. Because of the people of that day, not like us, we believe in the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. We believe that they are patriarchs. We believe that their wives were matriarchs. Uh, we know Sarah. We know Rivka or Rebecca. We know Rachel and Leah and Zilpah and Bilhah. And we hold them in high reverence. But the contemporaries of that day are no different than the journalists and the tabloidists of this day. They say, you think the woman was in his house all night and you didn't sleep with her? You gonna tell me that she spent the night there in his palace and they didn't do nothing? You think you're talking to a child? You think nothing happened? So that day, those are the rumors. So he had to say, no, I'm giving this to say that Sarah's dignity is in place. I'm giving this to mark that I didn't touch her. But I have to give something to quiet the mouths of the people because the people are talking. What did he take her for if he wasn't going to sleep with her? That's why he took her. So naturally, he took her. They don't know anything about no dream at night and God having spoken to him and nothing like that. They know that Abraham's wife spent the night with Abimelech the king. And um, that's all they needed to know. They didn't need to know more details. And um, so all that was the rumor and all that was the talk of the common day that this is what happened. And then, you know what we're going to say? Imagine us. We're the people. We ain't talking about no strangers. What do you give up the money for? What are you going to give a thousand pieces of silver for if he didn't touch her? If he didn't touch her, he was innocent. He gave up money. So you can't convince me of that. Our people, they will, they will be betting on this. They'll be betting on the corner. And, you know, setting up all kinds of rumor gauges of what happened. And that's why it had to be recorded. So that somebody had to write the story, officially, because the, the wagging of the tongues were too much. It says, and Abraham prayed unto God, and God healed Abimelech and his wife and his maidservants, and they bore children. The Lord had fast closed up all the wounds of the house of Abimelech because of Sarah, Abraham's wife. So we're saying that when they went for a week and nobody gave birth, you know, and they have on the records every day how many births take place all over the world. You know, on January 1st, they all day, but you know, January 1st, they tell you what children were born on January 1st, whether it be in America, whether it be in Japan, whether it be in the UK. They say this person had twins at exactly 12 midnight to bring in the first birth of the new year. And all year for 365 days, they know the number of children and the number of births that are recorded. Of course, you have to unrecord it. So when they went a couple of days and nobody was giving birth, and they start talking, wait a minute, something's wrong. For a whole week, nobody gives birth. And then they say that Abraham had to pray for him life. And then all of a sudden, when he prayed, then the wounds were open, and the women were having birth. And they realized that, you know, peace had been made. And now, what's going to make it worse? Now all these years, I'm saying, so that speculation would be, all these years Abraham was with Sarah, and she doesn't have any children. Now she spends one night with a beam of in the house, and he said he didn't sleep, but now she's pregnant. <laughs> you got all these things going on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Something <laughs> said, 
They're going to say, no, 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 you don't understand. The angels came to Abraham's house and they told him in the tent, you're going to have a baby this time next year. They're going to be back and testify. So when all we know is they've been together for 90 years. It ain't nothing happened. And now one night with a beamer like in his palace and she's pregnant. So what's going on here? So this is where everybody talking, 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 talking all around. But now we go into a whole new chapter. And now it says, and the Lord remembered Sarah. And he said unto, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. And Sarah conceived and bore to Abraham a son. And his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bore to him, Yitzchak, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son when he was eight days old. Hallelujah. As God had commanded him. And Abraham was 100 years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God had made laughter of me. Everyone that heareth will laugh on account of me. And she said, who would have said unto Abraham, that Sarah should give suck. For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned. And Abraham made a great feast of the outdoor on the day that Isaac was weaned. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she bore unto Abraham, making sport. Making sport more definitive than some of the other books that says that he was making like he was going to kill him. Making just like he was going to do away with him. Ishmael. He going to kill Isaac. Wherefore she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son. For he shall not be heir the son of this bondwoman with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was grievous in the sight of Abraham on the account of his son. And God said unto Abraham, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. And all that Sarah said unto thee, mocking unto her voice, for an Isaac shall see be called to thee. And also the son of the bondwoman, I will make a nation, because he is thy son, thy seed. And Abraham rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder, and the child, and sent her away. And she departed straight and straight in the wilderness of Beersheba. And the water was spent from the bottom. And she cast the child under one of the shrubs. And she went and sat her down over against him, a good way off, as it were a bow shot. For she said, Let me not look upon the death of the child. And she sat over against him, and lifted up her voice and wept. God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven, and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is there. So you see how it is that it said that Hagar wept and lifted up her voice. When it said, But God heard the son, he heard Ishmael. And so it meant that the young boy also was a prophet and the seed of Abraham, and was a great man. It didn't say God heard the mother, it said God heard the son. He said, Arise, lift up the lad, and hold him fast by thy hand, for a great nation I will make him. And God opened her eyes, you see, another key said, he opened her eyes, meaning that, it didn't say, and God made water appear. It didn't say God brought water out the sand or the desert, and then say God brought water out the rock. He said God opened her eyes and she saw the water, meaning the water was already there. But because of the grief, the grieving, the sadness of heart that her man put her aside, she's grieving for Abraham, she's angry with Sarah, that she was blind. She couldn't see the light waters that were right around her and near her. She actually, out of her anguish, out of her grief, out of her sadness, had already claimed death as her companion. 
because she couldn't see no water. And the water was there. But it simply says that the Lord opened up her eyes and she saw a well of water. And she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad and he grew. And he dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran. So you see, that's why when we were reading the Song of Moses, it said, the Lord said, I came from Mount Paran, from the wilderness of Seir, and I passed through Paran before I came to settle on the mountain of Sinai, which means the Lord passed through Edom and passed through Ishmael, all the seed of Abraham, before he brought the blessing back to rest on Israel. So Ishmael was known to dwell in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. So these would make them Egyptian Hebrews or Hebrew Egyptians. Israelites. Because Abraham was a Hebrew and the mother and the wife were Egyptian. So you still see the comedic Shemitic connection to Israel, which we don't highlight, but it's there. And that whole line would come up as Egyptian Hebrew. So Ishmael today is where the Muslims claim their line. Because Muhammad was supposed to trace his line to Ishmael. Not that all Muslims, but Muslims went throughout every nation. But when I say the Muslims trace themselves to Ishmael, they trace their prophetic lineage to Ishmael because they say that Muhammad was a prophet because he's also from the line of Abraham. And they trace that line of Abraham through Ishmael coming now through Muhammad's father Abdullah. Muhammad bin Abdullah. And it is um, not the mixed people like the Arabs. Arabs are different people from Ishmaelites. Arabs are Arabs. Ishmaelites are Ishmaelites. But the Arabs like to claim Islam like it's dead. The Arabs are the wild uncultured people. I'm not talking now, but that's why they had to pray five times a day. They wanted to kill Muhammad. They chased him out of Mecca. They chased him into a stronghold of black Hebrews known as the Ethiopian Hebrew, Kushi. That's what Medina was known as. Medina was a stronghold of black Hebrews. All Hebrews, we know are black, but I'm saying it distinctly because they're from the Ethiopian line. And there he raised up an army to go back and chase all the idol worshippers out of Mecca to claim Mecca as their holy place. His people didn't want to listen to him. So his first believers were Hebrews that were familiar. They wanted to just identify Belial as the only Hebrew, Ethiopian Hebrew, that was the first convert to Muhammad, who gave Muhammad their whole liturgy and the order of service and the call to prayer and how to pray and how to prostrate and how to call upon the name of God. They will give Bilal that credit, but they won't give the credit to say the whole community of Hebrews and Medina. And wherever you have any Muslims, you have a Medina. They name that town Medina, Medina, Medina. But that was their first stronghold where they got believers and they raised up an army to go back into Mecca and to claim Mecca and to clean out the Kaaba and throw out all the 365 gods they had in there that they worship a god for every day. And no Muslim scholar will deny that. If you speak that to them, they ain't gonna tell it to you voluntarily. But if you let them know, you know they will confirm it, that that is true. So. Some of them will even tell you that in the Quran is the passage of the Surah that will tell you that when Muhammad was on his knees praying to enter the paradise, he heard footsteps entering the paradise before his own. And when he looked up, who did he see? It was Bilal. He was going to the paradise even before Muhammad. Who Bilal again? The Ethiopian Hebrew who hung on to Muhammad and added on to Islam the order of Islam as they know it today. When you turn to the 12th surah in the Quran called Yusuf, and it is said and recorded that the angel Gabriel, whom Muhammad attributes having dictated the Quran to him, if you have access to the Quran, you look up the 12th surah. It's called the surah of Yusuf, Joseph. And the angel Gabriel 
opens up by saying, now let me reveal unto you and your language the story of Joseph and his brethren, which hitherto had not been told unto you in your language. Now what does that say? It says that the brothers, our Muslim brothers, and they are our brothers, who claim that Arabic is the oldest language in the world, why would the angel Gabriel say that I'm going to reveal the story of Yusuf to you now in your language? If the Arabic was the original language. Why would he have to say, now I'm going to reveal the story to you in your language? It would suggest that there was the Hebrew, that the story was already known amongst the Hebrews, and now I'm going to dictate it to you in Arabic, that you might also record, even though he couldn't record, but he couldn't write, because Muhammad was illiterate. He couldn't read nor write. That's why you have to remember the Quran by heart. Even to this day in Islamic schools, they pride themselves in remembering the whole Quran by memory. But that's how Muhammad had to remember because he couldn't read or write. So that's when a lot of our brothers would say, you know, the nation of Islam is down on the back of their Muhammad speaks. They still got on the back of their final call that we know that the Bible has been tampered with, even though it's a true book, but it's been tampered with, we cannot afford to go along with it word by word. When the Quran is a pure book, say, how can it be pure when the messenger never wrote nothing down? If the messenger of Muhammad never wrote a single letter down in Arabic and the book was not written until after his death by his nephew, then who was to say that what was written was what Gabriel said? Mm -hmm. If we want to be on record, that would be a simple deduction. So, not to stir up unnecessary controversy, but to set the record straight. Because most of the time when these records are being set, it's being set in an argument against white Jews. And they often score points on them to tell them that they are a fraud and to tell them that they are imposters. And in the argument, it kind of goes overboard to deal with other exaggerations and untruths. So to set the record straight, being the people ourselves, we can set the record straight of the role that we play. And because the Hebrews were so enthusiastic with saving Muhammad's life and helping him to establish his order in Mecca, he assumed that they were automatically be converts. He said, no, 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 converts to what? We're the original people. All the prophets have been sent through us. So if you have a prophet, that's fine. That prophet is for you. But not for us. Muhammad's not our prophet. He's your prophet. They got offended with that. That's how they changed the Shabbat day to worshiping the day for preparation of the Shabbat, the Juma on Friday. Juma is our day of preparation when we prepare for the Shabbat. And they end up making the Juma the day of worship on Friday. And they changed their direction of prayer from Jerusalem to Mecca because all Muslims used to pray to Jerusalem. And they changed it from Jerusalem to Mecca. And this is all this part because we're bringing up Ishmael and we're bringing up Hagar. I have to bring part of that history because that's how they come in. They come in through Hagar and through Ishmael into the covenant of Abraham and they own the covenant of having a prophet through that line. And that's why I think I make that clear. And Abraham said, I will swear. 
And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of the well of water, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abimelech said, I know not who hath done this thing. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet have I heard of it but today. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them to Abimelech, and they too made a covenant. And Abraham said, Seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abimelech said unto Abraham, What mean these seven ewe lambs? which thou hast set aside by themselves. And he said, Verily these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that it may be to me a witness that I have digged this well. Wherefore that place was called Beer Sheva, because there they swore both of them. So they made a covenant at Beer Sheva. And Abimelech rose up, the people captain of his host. And they returned into the land of the Philistine. And he planted a tamarisk tree in Beersheba and called there on the name of Yehovah, the everlasting God. So he said, Beshem Yehovah El 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 Olam. Yehovah El Olam, meaning God, the everlasting God. And Abraham sojourned and the Philistines in many days. So in those days, our form of worship was different. There was no tabernacle, no temple. Uh, so we were known to be in groves and around, you know, trees and groves. That's why this lesson opened up when he was by the terebates and membrane. Terebates are trees. And membrane was the person person who favored Abraham, he gave Abraham a portion of land. And now you see he planted a tamarisk tree, and they called upon the name of the Most High. It's when Moshe established our priesthood, and when he established the Bene Aharon, and he set the order of the priesthood, that he set those forms of worship on mountaintops and in groves and all of that, will no longer be. Now we do it in the tabernacle, we do it in the temple. But this is the way they knew the elements, and the way they knew, and the way they worship. That's why you see these things in here. And it's only in a new dispensation that that was proclaimed, not what we did anymore, as our means and our way of calling on the name of the Most High. So here's another name. El Olam, the everlasting God, the God that is forever. Olam is forever -ness, forever, ever, ever. And Abraham sojourned in the land of Philistines many days. I will be out. So 